So I am super excited to welcome to PM Mood author and body positive uh, extraordinaire Sonia Renee Taylor, who is the author of The Body Is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. Sonia, thank you so much for coming on PM Mood. Um, you are joining us from a beautiful, magical place that I have yet to visit, New Zealand. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, and it is indeed beautiful and magical. It is. Um, so, you know, in this, we're, we're living in a crazy time. Uh, yes. We are living in the midst of a horrific global pandemic. Um, where I believe that self-care is of the utmost important at this time. Like it is, mm -hmm. you know, many people are talking about this moment being a moment where we do need to journey inside, right? Like we are physically mm -hmm. inside. In the United States, we are physically indoors. And in New York, for me, we are literally sheltering in place. Yeah. But there is something also about taking this opportunity to actually be in your body. And this is yes. what you, you, you write about and you talk about. So can you explain, let's just jump in with the title of the book, that the body is not an apology. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, the title of the book comes from, uh, it started off as a conversation that became a poem, that became a Facebook page, that became a movement and a company, and then a book. So that's been the trajectory of that title. Um, and it, you know, it, it happened first in a conversation with a friend who was afraid she had an unintended pregnancy. And um, I'm, I am notorious for deep inquiry into my people I love's business um, from a place of love though, from a, from a right. place of love. And, and so I asked her about um, why she was having unprotected sex. I knew the person was a casual partner. I knew she wasn't really feeling him like that. And, um, and my friend had cerebral palsy and she said that her disability made it difficult um, for her to be sexual. So she didn't feel entitled to ask this person to use a condom. Like it would just be another thing. And I said to her, your body is not an apology. It's not something you offer to someone to say sorry for my disability. And wow. in that moment, in that moment, those words just crystallized. They became something, not just for her journey, but they became something for my journey. And I was clear that something was going to happen to him. And because I'm a poet, I was like, that sounds awfully poetic. I'm probably going to write that poem. So I did. I wrote the poem, The Body is Not an Apology. And I think that the words have always just been asking to, to be more because they just felt so true. Like I started to be able to reflect on all the ways in which being in this fat, black, queer, dark skin body, I was told that that was wrong in so many different ways and that mm -hmm. I should be sorry for being in this body and should be sorry for being in this mind the way that it works and should be sorry for being in this spirit the way that it works. And it felt so, it just felt so resonant when those words came out that I was like, right, what are we, why are we apologizing for, for being humans born in bodies, whatever those bodies look like? Uh, yeah. And then I think the words just continued to become what it was that they were meant to be in the world. You know, as somebody who has, I don't know, I couldn't, I probably couldn't tell you the number of diets that I have been on. I probably couldn't mm -hmm. tell you the amount of time and energy that I have spent pulling and prodding mm -hmm. and trying to fix myself in a mm -hmm. variety of different ways. And yeah. so the title hit me so much because I feel like I feel like, in all honesty, I owe my body an apology for treating it the way that I have treated it for the past 40 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we, I mean, I think that that's a, we, I mean, we all do in some ways, right? But, but our body doesn't actually want our apology. Our body wants our love, right? Mm. Like our body isn't like you owe me an apology. <laughs> our body's like, I just want a reconciled relationship. You know, like, I just, I just want us to be good because we're good. And I think that the, the, the way in which we're taught that like something is wrong and fix it. It's easy 
I think in this, you know, sort of like self-help world to turn that back on yourself and be like, okay, well, something was wrong externally and I've been trying to fix it. Well, now there must be something wrong internally and I'm trying to fix it. And then we get in this loop of like just never being good enough. I wasn't good enough when I was dieting all the time and now I'm not being good enough being body positive. And I think that there are all of these ways, uh, you know, that we, <laughs> a workshop participant called it meta shame. Shame for having shame. Now I'm ashamed because I have body shame. <laughs> it's like, whoa, can we ever get out, right? And I think that the, the, yeah. invitation, the invitation is to, to just bring whatever it is more love, right? Like whatever it is that you're not, that you think needs fixed actually just needs more love. Yeah. So in the, in the book, you, you talk about and you give definition to um, and presence to radical self-love, which mm-hmm. you describe as being very different than self-acceptance or self-confidence. Yeah. yeah. Say more uh, uh, about that, about what, because I thought, right, and it's not necessarily, you're not saying that, I, that any of us that think that is wrong, but it's just mm-hmm. like, think about the, the progression right? Yeah. The progression of, of this terminology and what it means. It's almost as, as a black lesbian, you know, it was like, we started with, let's just tolerate us, right? Mm-hmm. And we moved from mm-hmm. a place of tolerance to a place of, no, I don't want to be tolerated. I actually want to be accepted. I, I tolerate Brussels sprouts without bacon. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to accept it in my plate. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I think. um, So for me, I think there are a couple of distinctions. The first is just my own orientation to the world, which is that I'm, I'm not, I'm not interested in, in simply helping individuals feel better about themselves, because just feeling better about oneself does not change the systemic and structural issues of inequity and injustice that exist in the world. You you know, our individual self-esteem has not toppled one system of inequality. Mm. And so for me, this work is not just like feel good work. This is political work. This work is Mm. social justice work. And so consequently, um, Self-esteem is not a political issue. <laughs> self-esteem and self-confidence are individual. They're fleeting. They're circumstantial. You look cute mm. that day. People notice your outfit. You feel popping. They don't notice your outfit. You over here wondering whether or not you really put it together like you thought you did, <laughs> right? Like, so those are conditional experiences. And radical self-love is not a conditional experience. It's our inherent existence. It's how you arrived here on the planet before all of the other layers of crap showed up on top of us to tell us Mm -hmm. that somehow we were deficient. And so, and those messages of deficiency are not individual messages, right? Like there's a reason that you plus millions of other people can't count the number of diets they've been on, including myself. Mm -hmm. That's not accidental, right? That's, that's systemic. Somebody makes a lot of money off of the fact that we're deeply invested in thinking that something is wrong and we need to fix it. There's an entire economic, political, and social system tied to those ideas. And so a radical self-love acknowledges that my inherent existence as love is, as Audre Lorde said, it's a political act. It's an act Mm -hmm. of political warfare. And, And that taking back my experience of being 100% worthy and powerful and divine in the body that I have as it is right now, and I mean that in the spiritual, mental, and physical body, is is an act that interrupts a system that profits off of us not believing that. That's mm. political. That's radical, right? And that if enough of us divest from that system, that system falls. That's radical. Um, and so the ways in which... Why yeah. do you think, though, why do you think that there is such a level of discomfort when people decide to divest from that system? Because I would argue, like, you know, let's just look at one example, pop culture example. Lizzo. Mm-hmm. Lizzo mm-hmm. is the example of somebody that is like, I'm not going to be ashamed that I am a, mm-hmm. that I am a big black woman. 
Mm-hmm. I like the way I look. I like how I show up. I like the way I move and present. And that is uncomfortable for folks. We are doing uh, essays and books <laughs> about the levels of which we feel uncomfortable about Lizzo's comfort. Yes, yes. Well, because Lizzo's comfort challenges our worldview. It, it challenges, it means that if Lizzo is okay in Lizzo's body, then what have I spent the last 35 years doing? Mm-hmm. Then what, then what, then what, where is the payoff that I will get for the amount of investment that I have put into trying to conform to this system? Whereas Lizzo means that we won't get the payoff. That's the fear. And wow. that's the discomfort. That's the fear and that's the discomfort. If everybody divests, then the thing that I have built my whole life around, my identity around, my worth around, gets dismantled. And then we're, then we're really left to shelter in place. <laughs> to be wow. in, a, in our own selves, really having to reckon with, with what we thought our self-worth was. Damn. 